How you doing everybody? This is uh, Mark New Church. Um, I feel honored and privileged to be able to uh, be before you and to share a word of encouragement um, from God. So uh, I was asked to do this, uh, so please bear with me. I haven't done this before. I put um, my uh, notes on paper, so forgive me if I have to look down a, uh, a few times to figure out where I'm at. All right, but uh, I want to encourage you with um, reminding you that in a time of crisis, we have access to God's power. Um, for whatever the situation is, whether it's a relational uh, situation, uh, maybe there's trouble in the marriage or, or with, with uh, children, um, it could be financial, maybe you lost a job, maybe you're in debt, uh, it could be whatever it is. Even this global crisis that we find ourselves in, um, we just need to remember that we serve an almighty God. An almighty God uh, who, who just holds everything in his hands, right? He is the Lord of all creation. Colossians 1, 16 through 17 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Very encouraging words. Jeremiah 27, 5 says that with my great power and outstretched arm, I have made the earth and its peoples and the animals that are on it, and I give it to anyone I please. So the Bible basically tells us that God, as a creating God, as a creator God, he holds everything in his hands. It's like a, um, a clump of clay, right? He, our, the creation is like a clay in God's hands. He molds it, he shapes it, he needs it, he does whatever he needs to do and works it to his own end. And ultimately for the believer, we can understand that um, whatever that end is, it is for our good. Because all things work for the good of those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, is what the scripture says. Uh, in John uh, chapter 16, verse 33, uh, I don't have this one in my notes, but it was, uh, he says that in this world you will have trouble, but to take heart, because I have overcome the world. When, and this was right before Jesus was arrested and he was spending time with his disciples. And then uh, in chapter 17, he's praying to the Lord, about his disciples in uh, 17 9 and 11 he says I pray for them I am not praying for the world but for those that you have given me for they are yours all I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them I will remain in the world no longer but they are still in the world and I am coming to you Holy Father protect them by the power of your name the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Protect them by the power of your name. You know, when I think about, and this is, I'm going off script now, when I'm thinking about his name, I know that we, somebody else was talking about the names of God and, and we think about what Jesus is saying here, the name that you gave me. You know, when we look through the scripture, we see so many great names. And I'm reminding of, reminded of a song that I used to sing, you know, in the choir, with the choir, because I can't really sing. But uh, with the choir, there was a song, and I don't remember the name of it, but it kind of went something like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, right? But, you know, when it's, there's a section where the choir starts singing the names of God, the names of Jesus, and he says, uh, wonderful, glorious, holy, righteous, victorious, conqueror, triumphant, and mighty, healer, deliverer, shield and defense, strong power and my best friend, omnipotent, omnipresent, soon coming king, alpha, omega, lord of everything, holy, holy, holy is your name. And when we think about that in Jesus' words here, he's praying for his disciples to protect them by the power of your name. And then shortly after that, he's, he's also praying a, a, a similar prayer about those who will believe in him based on what the um, 
disciples went and did as far as spreading the gospel. So he was praying for all of us. When we believe in Jesus, when we trust in him and we are obedient to God's word, we have access to his power for our needs and our protection. And we can be confident about that. We can be very confident like David was. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, David knew that he had access to God's power. He knew this, right, when he challenged the giant warrior Goliath. Uh, so just imagine, you know, when, when the Israelite army was fleeting, uh, every time Goliath uh, stepped out and challenged them, it said that they fled in great fear. But when David heard him, he didn't flee. He just said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And shortly after that, when he, when he gathered uh, the five smooth stones, he ran to the battlefield. He ran to go towards Goliath. He wasn't afraid. And why? Because he knew he had access to God's power for his protection. He knew that. Because God had done it for him before. Because he said that I defeated the lion, I defeated the bear, the bear and, and, and this Philistine will be as, as, one, of the, as one of them. It's basically what he said. So we have to, you know, kind of be like David and be confident about, you know, God being there to help us. Elijah, a big pastor was just uh, preaching about this very recently uh, when he was talking about uh, Elijah and his servant when they were being uh, trapped by the Aramean army. That's in 2 Kings chapter 6 if you want to read it. The servant was riddled with anxiety over their present situation. I mean, it just looked bad. It looked devastating. It looked like there was no hope for them. But Elijah, he told his anxious friend, do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then he prayed for, uh, for the servant's eyes to be open. And behold, when the servant looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Right, and that's what the Psalms tell us. Psalms 121 one through three says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. All right, so we can be encouraged for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We could be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who told uh, King Nebuchadnezzar that if you throw us into this blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us. Wow. Can you imagine having that kind of faith and trust and belief in God? But, but let me tell you something else important about that. What followed those words, he said, but even if God does not deliver us, we will still serve him. We won't follow or serve the golden image. Right, so even then they knew because all things are for the good of those who love the Lord, they understood that, that it didn't matter if things didn't turn out the way that they had hoped or the way that they had planned. But they was gonna trust God because they know that ultimately the potter is gonna work it out to the, for their end. So God's people need to trust God. We need to trust God. And I'm going to read for you uh, one of my favorite stories uh, in, the, in the Bible. It's in Joshua uh, chapter 3. You know, we know that uh, after Moses had departed to be with the Lord and uh, Joshua was given the um, charge over the Israelites getting to the promised land, um, you know, they're just following the Lord. You know, wherever the Lord led, um, led them and they weren't always uh, sure where they were going. Uh, I think it Right here in the beginning of the chapter, we find that they've been camping about three days uh, at the Jordan, uh, near the Jordan River. And then it says that the only thing really that they knew was that they were to follow God's presence, right, in the Ark of the Covenant. They were supposed to follow the Ark of the Covenant. When the, when the Levites uh, picked up the Ark and, and started moving, all they knew was that they were to move with it, right? So... Um, but they were trusting God in all of it, right? Because God had just got them through 40 
years in the desert, right? So they, they had confidence in knowing that God will make a provision for them, will make a way for them, would uh, remove obstacles for them, would, uh, you know, make those mountain hills low and those crooked paths straight, you know, like the word tells us. They knew that. So here in uh, chapter uh, verse 6, let's see. After Joshua had congreg uh, had gathered the people, uh, it says here, verse 6, Joshua said to the priests to take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went on ahead of them. Now this is interesting. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. All right, so now, that, so what sounded so simple, the priests will carry the Ark of the Covenant and step into the river. Now they get to the river and it says that, that it was at flood stage. All right, so think about that. I mean, I, when it's at flood stage, I mean, bad things happen, right? Things get swept away. The current is strong. Um, and, 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 and the, uh, the river at flood stage, I mean, it's wider. So now it's probably, it's deeper and it's wider, right? So there is a lot more risk. So this was a lot more trouble than maybe some of them, uh, I don't know, maybe they anticipated it because it was harvest, but, but just, uh, bear with me. <laughs> so, um, it says it was at flood, at flood stage during the harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Serafan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Araba, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed, uh, passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. All right, so again, flood stage, right? All they know is that they're going to follow uh, the Ark of the Covenant wherever, wherever uh, it goes. And here the priests, you think about, talk about faith. They see this flood stage river that's extremely difficult to pass, I can imagine. And they, without blinking or batting an eye, they step in it, right? Because they knew that the Lord had told them that he was going to allow them to cross in, on dry ground, right? So think about that. What about the promises the Lord makes for us all the time, right? We know, right, that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We know. That he says that 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 you know all the things that 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 uh, that that happen work for our good, right? Whether it's good things or bad things, right? So so here they are. They're looking at this apparently bad thing, this serious flood, and they step right in it, in full confidence that God is going to do what He said He uh, He would do. And then you know He probably did it in a way that they didn't expect. So think about this. It said that it was a great distance away as soon as they their feet touched the water's edge the water stopped flowing and piled up a great distance away so the town called adam and and 
it's been a little while since I've done this research, but if I remember correctly, it was somewhere between what, 13, 14, maybe 17 miles away, this town of Adam. So think about that. You think that those is, uh, Levite priests could see that distance away? Just picture here in the, in the town of Dallas, in the city of Dallas, and, and God is piling up uh, the water up in Cartersville somewhere. That's an approximate distance, I guess. I can't imagine being able to see the water being piled up that distance away. And then, of course, you know, it's coming downstream, so it's going to be a while as the water's flowing before, before it becomes dry ground. Right, because that water's going to eventually flow those 17 miles all the way. So, this, so they just stepped out in that water in full faith that God is going to do something. Because he said he was going to do it. He promised it, and they believed him. And then eventually by the time they got into the middle of the river, they were on dry ground. So, you know, we could be encouraged by that. I mean, it encourages me, right? Because God's not going to always do it where we see him doing it. He's not going to be doing it in the way that, that, that we expect him to. And, and obviously, you know, they couldn't see what he was doing, but he was working. He was working. He said he'd be working. Um, you know, that's what faith is all about, right? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of those things not seen, right? We'll eventually see God's work and it will be in his good time. So I want to leave you with this last scripture. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 21. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide, how long, and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Be encouraged in the Lord's word today. Thank you.